everyone and welcome to the first of three panels in our symposium on Afghanistan. Today we will be discussing the legacy of the U.S. involvement and the implications of the withdrawal. We would first like to acknowledge the importance of promoting Afghan and woman voices on the subject and we made a great effort to have these perspectives represented on each of the three panels but unfortunately given the nature of the ongoing situation and the importance of confidentiality at this time we are unable to bring these voices to this panel but we have three speakers with expertise and a long history of study and work in the region that we are excited to welcome today. Mike McGinnis is a veteran of 16 years in the US Army during which he deployed to Afghanistan three times. He is currently a free freelance writer and host of the You Don't Know History podcast. Alan Mentha is the co-founder of Welcome Home Jersey City, an organization created in the shadow of the Syrian war in 2016 as refugees started to resettle in Jersey City. In addition to this volunteer work, Alan is employed at Taylor and Francis LLC. Eric Isaacson is pursuing his MA in Middle Eastern History here at Tufts University. Previously, he served in the US Air Force as an airborne cryptologic linguist, and he was trained in Persian Dari at the Defense Language Institute in Monterey, California. He was later deployed to Afghanistan between 2010 and 2011. Thank you all for joining us both in person and on Zoom. And if you have any questions throughout the panel, please send them in the Q&A box to be answered at the end of the discussion. I will now pass it on to our mo moderator for today's panel, Zach Burphy, who is a junior studying international relations and Middle Eastern studies and is co-president of the Middle East Research Group. Hey there, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us again. I believe we have over 30 people watching in person at the Fletcher School, like Cabot 205. So thank you all for coming in person and virtually. Um, yeah, first, we'd, I'd love to just get some opening statements from the panelists. Um, so they're going to talk about their prior experience with the country and their initial reactions, thoughts and reactions when Afghanistan fell to the Taliban. So Alan, if you would like to go first. Sure. My name's Alan. I am the executive director of Welcome Home. And Welcome Home provides uh, community services to refugees from all over the world in Jersey City. Um, we focus on educational employment and a material support um, as an extension of the services that are brought by the resettlement agencies in New Jersey and to an extent in New York. Um, we, we, we work with uh, a number of, of Afghan families who came to Jersey City with a special immigrant visa status. Um, and those families are entitled to, you know, all of the benefits of refugees. They arrive uh, with the ability to start working right away. And um, they're entitled to public assistance and they're entitled to all the services from the refugee resettlement agencies. Um, we expect to welcome a number of families from um, the uh, joint base mcguire dix Lakehurst in New Jersey uh, in the coming weeks and months. Um, but primarily, um, I expect that we'll be serving humanitarian parolees from Afghanistan. And humanitarian parolees like asylum seekers uh, are not entitled to any public benefits. They're entitled to few services from the resettlement agencies, and they have to apply for work authorization, which generally takes about six months these days to receive. So unlike the um, refugees and SIVs, the special immigrant visa holders who um, arrive at refugees because they, they serve uh, with the armed forces in Afghanistan, the US armed forces, um, these folks are gonna require a lot more support from private organizations, from private individuals, from community-based groups like ours. So we have really shifted our focus in the past few weeks to raise money um, and to find available housing for these folks. Um, we're gonna have to match funders with um, affordable housing, which is at a premium these days, particularly in this part of the country. Um, and, and, you know, I, I spend much of my days uh, talking to people about the special plight of um, these parolees and, and advocating with government officials um, 
particularly at the state level of the senators, so that um, Congress will uh, approve benefits for these humanitarian parolees. So that's, you know, that's, that's kind of uh, where I stand. I don't have a lot of direct knowledge about Afghanistan. I've never been there and we depend on translators to help us communicate with many of the families, especially at first. Um, but uh, we are seeing a, a, a really a once in a generation event um, right now that will require all of our communities to come together and, and collaborate in ways that we never have. So um, I think that's enough for me for now. I'll turn it back over to you, Zach. Thank you for having me, having us. Yeah, thank you very much, Alan. Uh, Mike, if you'd like to go, go next. Yeah, uh, you know, thank you everybody for uh, bearing with me, uh, you know, um, but, you know, I really do appreciate the invitation to come on and, and partake. Uh, but I uh, deployed to Afghanistan three times between 2007 and 2012. Uh, I did 15 months between 2007 and 2008, 12 months between 2009 and 2010, um, and then I did eight months in 2012. Um, you know, my... It, it, service, uh, you know, I would say it was always colored by my politics, but especially the, the longer I stayed in, the more I realized that we were not doing enough um, to help the Afghan people. Uh, you know, we were failing in that mission, uh, not just as a defense department or a, an armed service, but overall with a war effort that, you know, was widely forgotten, um, you know, or, or maybe even ignored. I'd even say, um, but uh, you know, it still kind of falls on the country to realize that we have seen historically, we can hold our political officials accountable uh, when it comes to these types of conflicts, especially when you have something as counterintuitive as counterinsurgency. Um, but yeah, you know, I, uh, I have a lot of feelings about what happened in late August, uh, other, you know, and I'll sum it up quickly. Uh, and that it was um, a prime example of, of his poor planning. Um, you know, we, we decided we were gonna pull out, we pulled out all the infrastructure that possibly could have been used to uh, make it easier for our Afghan allies and the people requesting visas to, to have the, the ability, one, to have just their paperwork processed in order to leave a, uh, you know, the country but, you know, instead we pulled out and then had to end up sending back. Uh, so it's, it's a, a, a humanitarian disaster that I, I don't think is being played up enough or, or being paid close enough attention to. Uh, and if we don't really focus the way Alan's organization is on, on trying to assist them, it could only end up being much, much worse. Thanks, Mike. Um, Eric, if you want to go next. Sure, thanks, Zach. Um, so my experience with Afghanistan um, actually begins before I, I even went there. So in the Air Force, I was an airborne cryptologic linguist uh, trained in Persian Dari at the Defense Language Institute out in Monterey, California. Uh, spent 15 months there learning Persian, specifically the Dari dialect spoken in, um, in Afghanistan. Um, but that's accompanied by uh, a um, an education in the culture, in the terrain, in the, the myriad ways that we might experience the country. Um, and our instructors were all from Afghanistan. Uh, many had uh, left quite a while before, um, either during the civil war or Soviet invasion or uh, uh, after the rise of the Taliban. But um, so I got a, a good sense of the different people. Uh, we had a good cross section of the different ethnicities um, in our teaching team and uh, certainly a feel for the language and, and the culture. Um, and I was there for seven months between 2010 and 2011. Um, I was uh, not employed in a linguist capacity during deployment, um, but I was, uh, I was flying in support of aerial reconnaissance and intelligence. Um, so I saw a lot of the country from uh, both the air and the ground. Um, I spent time uh, between uh, Bagram and Kandahar with a little bit of time up, in, up north in Mazar Sharif. 
Um, and I, I did get to use my language a bit on base where uh, some of the uh, locals in, in the area of Bagram were employed to do sort of menial tasks around base. And I used to volunteer for uh, a guard duty for them to escort them around uh, the base so I could use my language while in country. And so that was an interesting thing. Um, and uh, definitely had um, an appreciation for the country, for the people, for the language. Um, definitely saw some of the living conditions they had and uh, sort of anecdotal uh, histories of what life was like under the Taliban prior to US uh, involvement. Um, in terms of the, the withdrawal, um, it's like in, in its idea, like, uh, you know, we've had several presidents now talking about we're going to we're going to pull out of the Middle East and, and Afghanistan. But in the idea, I can see why that's an attractive um, an attractive proposition, particularly when, uh, you know, they're beholden to voters. Um, but the way that the way that it went down, where it was just this complete kind of withdrawal and now it's just it, it's chaos. Um, it wasn't done with any respect to history. The last time that there was a major vacuum in Afghanistan between the Soviets. Um, and, and when the Americans ultimately came in, that's when we see the rise of, of a group like the Taliban. That's when we see them harboring um, groups like Al Qaeda. And it, uh, it, it's, it's not a great situation. So um, I'm very kind of uh, disillusioned with the way it went down. Um, and I, I uh, agree with Mike in that there, uh, there really wasn't, um, it seems like, uh, to use his term, piss poor planning or, um, uh, that there was either inattention or ignorance of many of the factors that should have been considered when approaching uh, the, the the task of withdrawing. And thanks, Eric. I'm going to go off that last topic, and and one of the biggest topics in regard to the just seemingly incredibly quick um, takeover of the country by the Taliban has been the, the really quick collapse of the ANA, Afghan National Army. Um, there have been, you know many American pundits talking, you know, saying we poured so much money, so much equipment, so much training into the ANA, and they just like toppled over within days. But in reality, it was much deeper than that. Um, Mike, if you want to kind of talk about that and, and the quick collapse and what the US contributed to, to these issues. Yeah, I mean, this is what kills me when I hear that. All right. And if I get a bit heated, I do apologize, because I, I serve with many ANA units. Some were good, some were bad, but you can honestly say that about any uniform military, right? Um, but to say that they didn't fight and just collapsed, uh, even though that's a fallacy, um, what the United States uh, government and the military specifically did is after the invasion in 2001, we handpicked warlords that suddenly became CANDAC commanders, which would be like a brigade level equivalent here in the United States Army. Um, you know, and these, these now Kandak commanders uh, would grift uh, to no, you know, to, to no end. Like we, they would set up, they would use your people to set up checkpoints to shake down truck drivers. Um, and honestly, they flat out robbed their um, subordinates, uh, you know, because there's, there's no direct deposit. So how do you think payroll gets, gets handed out? It goes to the Kandak commander. Well, he takes his cut, passes it down to the next level. Uh, they, he take, that commander takes his cut and he passes it all the way down to where there's barely anything left and it's not the promised salary uh to the soldiers that are out there fighting uh you know on the ground um but like you know and i and i pose this question to somebody else if there was no incentive for you to change the material conditions in which you live are you really going to stand there uh and, and and get shot or blown up i mean that's it's an honest question uh because i'll tell you right now i won't <laughs> you know i'm sorry i don't um, and, and then, you know, you, you also have people that, you know, those same pundits that are like, well, they wouldn't fight for Afghanistan. Well, a lot of these, these soldiers, uh, you know, they, they're not fighting for Afghanistan. They were literally fighting so they could have some money to send back home to take care of their family. Um, you know, and, and I think that, you know, uh, you know, the other two panels could probably attest to this even more than so than myself. But this is a very tribal country where people identify with their clan and their tribe a hell of a lot more than this kind of uh, pie in the sky idea of Afghanistan, right? So, I mean, it's, it's, it's very frustrating to hear that because 
you know, almost 100,000 uniformed members of the, uh, for, you know, the, the Afghan military under Karzai and Ghani, you know, they, they were killed fighting the Taliban. So like, it's, it, you know, it, it, for me, it, it's complete, it's a completely misleading topic when you hear uh, one, especially from people who have never stepped foot in the country or haven't even spoken to an actual person from Afghanistan, uh, you know, throwing things like this out. Yeah, Alan, would you like to go off that? A little bit. Um, I would just say that I would, I would um, kind of second what Mike said in that it's, it's very difficult to generalize about Afghanistan. It's, it's a very complex country. It's a very heterogeneous country um, with lots of uh, significant uh, minority populations that you know don't identify with each other necessarily, um, and um, and even the families, you know, the families that we help here, they don't necessarily um, feel that they have that much in common with each other. Uh, some of them do, um, but it's 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 based in part on linguistic and religious differences, um, ethnic differences, um, and uh, sometimes their attitudes towards Western culture generally. Uh, but I think that the idea of Afghanistan is very abstract. Um, and so, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's risky business to, to try to lump everybody into, um, you know, the same mold. Uh, Hey, Eric, have you had any experience with that kind of tribalism and how it contributed to these issues? Um, yeah, to, to a degree, I, um, I, can, uh, I can agree with both uh, Alan and Mike um, in, in some of these assessments. Um, it is a very tribal country. It is a very uh, ethnically, uh, linguistically, and religiously uh, divisive country. Um, you've got the four major uh, ethnicities in Afghanistan. You have the Pashtuns, the Tajiks, the Uzbeks, and the the Hazara. Um, the the former three are predominantly Sunni, while the Hazara are predominantly Shia. Um, the, the the Pashtu is a language uh, uh, that's spoken there uh, by the majority ethnicity. Uh, the Pashtuns. You also have uh, Dari, uh, which is a uh, a branch of Persian. So uh, along with Tajik, Dari. Um, and, and Farsi is spoken in Iran. So there's, there's people speaking different languages, there's people practicing different religions, there's people um, of, of different ethnic groups. And there is still a very tribal mentality there um, where they're often at odds. Um, and you know, this is true now, this was true in 2001. Um, they, there have been times where they, they work together um, with the Americans against a common enemy, the Taliban. But if you look at the civil war uh, that we have following the collapse of the um, the uh, the withdrawal of the Soviets and the subsequent collapse of the um, indigenous Afghan uh, communist regime, we see uh, the leaders, the warlords of these different ethnic groups, uh, tearing the country apart. They they were all shelling Kabul because they were upset that their that they personally or their ethnic group was not adequately represented in the new government. So there is a lot of this going on. Um, and I think it's also important to note that, um, uh, and I think Mike was kind of getting towards this, Af Afghanistan is kind of uh, an idea um, that many people aren't really necessarily on board with. So if Afghan is synonymous with Pashtun, so land of the Pashtuns. Well, uh, they were the majority group. The leadership was typically uh, traditionally Pashtun. Where does that leave other significant ethnic groups? Um, it, it's not that they're refuting the existence of a political entity such as Afghanistan, but um, is it something they, they're going to fight for? And I think another concern when we're thinking about the ANA and the pundits kind of ripping them apart, it's really easy to make comparisons between um, uh, American servicemen and what if we saw Americans running away in combat like that, shot for cowardice or whatever the, the punishment uh, in vogue at the time is going to be. But um, Americans traditionally are not fighting on, you know, in their own backyard. We're going somewhere else to fight. And these people have families. These people have connections to the community that are all at risk if they're affiliated with an organization that is opposed to the Taliban. So there's a lot of uh, complexity here, whether we're talking uh, about demographics or the political reality on the ground. 
Um, it's it's far too complex and it is fallacious and outright ignorant to to make these these assertions of you know the ANA they're you know they're they're cowards or they're they're not loyal to Afghanistan. It, it's not that cut and dry it, to make these uh, these assertions. Yeah, thank you very much, all of you. Um, one of these these uh, ethnic um, ethnic uh, groups and ethnic areas has, has still held out resistance um, in the Panjshir Valley in the north. Um, the Taliban have claimed in the last week that they've conquered the whole um, the whole valley, um, but. You know, just as when the Soviets, you know, supposedly conquered the valley in the 90s, um, they held out uh, for many, many years. And and um, NRF or um, National Resistance Front spokespeople are saying that they're just waiting for the right moment to strike. Um, what do you think this signals to like the rest of Afghanistan and other, like could this inspire other resistance movements across the country? Um, Mike, if you want to touch on that. I mean, that... that... That's always a touchy question, right? Um, I mean, the, the the resistance front has a great kind of face with uh, Ahmad Shah Massoud's son, right? Uh, because Massoud ran the Taliban ragged. Uh, whenever they tried to get up in the Panjshir, it never ended well for them. And they, you know, that's why they they literally stooped to uh, loading up plastic explosive inside of a video camera so they could explode it near him, right? Um, but it, the, the thing is with Masood's kid, I don't think he has the military acumen uh, that his father had. Um, but I mean, getting back to like what Eric was saying, it, it, so many people in Afghanistan uh, are going to associate more with their tribe, right? So if you have the majority Pashtuns who like say what happened after the Taliban took power, right? They went into the Hazarajat and just started murdering Hazara uh, by the thousands, right? So the Hazaras kind of circled the wagon, so to speak, around each other in order to fight back. Um, and I, I could see that happening, right? Like, say, whoever, uh, you know, the Taliban identify as a Pashtun military commander to kind of go, because there are going to be people that are like, yo, you know, we're not happy with you being back here. Uh, and they're going to send somebody out there that is, you know, go going to mostly be made up of the Pashtun ethnic group. I mean, is it, Tajiks will go and protect themselves. Kazakhs will go and, you know, they will form groups to protect themselves. Hazaras will do the same thing. Um, so I, I, I wouldn't say there's going to be this big unified uh, resistance because even under Massoud, it wasn't a big unified resistance. Um, you know, Masood, if I remember correctly, and Eric, please correct me if I'm wrong, but he was ethnically Tajik, I believe, um, you know, and that's where most of his manpower came from, where people within his own kind of ethnic and linguistic group. Um, it's just, I, I'll finish off by saying this, it's going to be very difficult, I think, um, to get a multilingual, multicultural, multi-religious uh, uh, kind of popular front resistance to the Taliban going. Uh, Eric, do you want to say thoughts on this or can we move on? Sure. Yeah, I, I wholeheartedly agree with, with Mike's assessment there. And um, looking at historically, even if we're looking at, uh, you know, pre-2001 or the early days when we had a very small footprint um, uh, special forces teams go in uh, in November of 2001. Um, they, the the resistance forces that you had were typically of the same ethnic group as the commander that they had, and you would have these really charismatic type commanders like Ahmed Shah Massoud or uh, Dostum for the Uzbeks. Um, you, you had similar type guys for, for the Pashtuns who like Gulbuddin uh, Hekmatyar, who himself was not Taliban, but he was just as bad as the Taliban. Um, and they, they do kind of keep to their own. Um, the, of course, there, there is some collaboration at times. Um, post 9-11, a lot of this was facilitated by a foreign power. We have the U.S. go in. They're working with the Northern Alliance. Uh, Dostum comes back. He had fled to Turkey. 
he comes back. Uh, if anyone's seen the the movie Twelve Strong, it's that story. You got the Michael Bay treatment. Um, it's uh, it's it, it's it's going to be a, a tall order to ask these very disparate groups um, who are likely, you know, in in the event my my expectation would be if they are mounting resistance, who's in charge of the resistance, um, and then. If they have a successful resistance, what happens to the country? Who's in power after that? Do we wind up with another civil war like we had between 92 and 96, where Masood, Hekmatyar, Dostum, all these guys tore apart the country because they were dissatisfied with the amount of control they were given? Um, it's, uh, I, I don't know what's going to happen. Um, it's, uh, you know, if history teaches us anything, it's we, we cannot predict the future, but drawing on what has happened in the past, it, it probably doesn't bode very well. Um, I don't know of the you know, qualifications for Masood's son exactly, but Masood in certain ways, he was definitely a warlord. There's a very unsavory side to Masood that we tend to overlook, but um, he, uh, he could be considered in certain ways a Renaissance man. He, he was, uh, you know, had a European education, he spoke French, he, um, he was a great tactician, he, he read and wrote poetry, um, and he was very charismatic for his people, such to the extent that he was assassinated by Al Qaeda um, in a very insidious fashion because they needed to get rid of him out of uh, the Panjshir Valley. Um, his, his nickname had been Shiri Panjshir, which is the Lion of Panjshir. He was uh, almost like a, a Napoleonic type figure in terms of the, the scale or the, the, the esteem with which he was regarded. Um, I don't know if that character exists right now. In Afghanistan, um, and only time is going to tell uh, if, if we see them emerge. And next, we're going to move more towards um, the U.S. withdrawal itself. Um, many criticisms of the, of the withdrawal have come to surround the issues of the special immigrant visa program, like Alan mentioned earlier. So, Alan, if you want to I'll touch on a little more specifically your experience dealing with um, um, uh, people in the SIV program in the last five years and how that's changed in the last month, month or two. Um, yeah, I, um, I'm not sure what to say about um, the specific experience we've had with uh, SIVs. It's, it's, it's the only um, sort of Afghan uh, refugee that we've worked with. Um, and, you know, SIVs are you know, they're translators, they, they might be drivers, anyone who's employed with the armed forces. And um, it's also difficult to generalize about them in terms of their education and uh, even mastery of English. Uh, I would like to, uh, but I can't. Um, and we work with, um, you, know, uh, you know, families who are, uh, if, if Afghanistan is a very, Af abstract idea. One thing I can say about the SIVs is that um, they, to some degree, believed in um, the American idea. Um, they saw hope there, uh, I believe. Um, and that's my impression from just working with families here, not from any kind of informed uh, opinion or data. But, um, you know, we have been advocating for uh, several administrations to accelerate the pace of resettlement for these SIVs because it's, a, it's an incredibly complicated application that takes years to process. And we've been advocating that it be simplified. Um, we've been collaborating with other organizations like Veterans for, um, uh, I can't remember, it's Vet Veterans for American Ideals or something like that um, to, um, you know, to work with specific legislators to introduce legislation to, um, to to change this process to make it easier because the writing's been on the wall for a long time that we were going to withdraw from Afghanistan. I mean, this didn't come up uh, just last year or just this year. Uh, we've known this for a very long time. Um, so you know, just to go back to the beginning, um, I mean, it was a chaotic withdrawal, but really, um, it's been. Uh, you know, there's several administrations that can be held to account for how poorly this is managed. Um, and now as a consequence, 
of this sort of mad scramble to get onto a transport plane uh, where I believe uh, probably a small minority of the evacuees were actually SIVs or were in some stage of the SIV process. What we have were people who probably were able to make a good case to the guards or whoever was managing you know, the onboarding of the planes that they had a legitimate fear of the Taliban. And there are many people in Afghanistan who do. Um, and, um, and, 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 and those are the folks we're gonna have to work with now, folks that we don't know nearly as much about. Um, and you know the, the family that we're gonna help uh, move in uh, on Monday, you know the, the head of the household is uh, he's got a three month consulting contract with the United Nations. He's a banker. He's very well educated. All four of his children speak English fluently. They went to an American school in Afghanistan. Um, he will eventually have to apply for work authorization, um, like every like every other parolee. But he's going to be the easiest of all of the folks we're going to work with. Everyone else is going to be a major challenge um, because they don't have connections already in the United States. They don't have friends already. They don't have um, the same education, uh, the same privilege, uh, the same access. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm going to feel partial to this um, fellow that we're helping because we've met and we like each other, you know, and we can speak to each other without the, the obstacles of language. That's not the case, that's not gonna be the case for probably 95% or more of the, uh, the families that we work with in the coming months and years. Hey, thanks, Alan. And so we're gonna be doing most of our Q&A from the audience later, but this is um, very related. Um, so this is from Emily. Um, it's a question about um, the cause for delays in vetting SIVs. Uh, if translators and allies were trustworthy, trustworthy enough to conduct military operations with us, how is that not enough of a qualification to provide them refuge? How 20 years in is this still a problem and is for anyone? I mean, I'm just going to be blunt about this. Uh, we all know why. Uh, it's, uh, you know, we, we have an inherently unequal uh, governmental structure. Uh, that makes it hard for people of color, um, amongst other minority groups, uh, to to get ahead. And if we ha we're having that issue with with Americans, you know, people who were born here, um, do you really think they're going to extend that to somebody who literally has been other for twenty years? Uh, that that's the sad part. Afghan people are are ridiculously warm. Uh, you know, they, they're, I, I loved, uh, you know, probably 90% of the Afghans I came into contact with. And I say 90% because the other 10% was actively trying to kill me while I was there. Um, you know, but, you know, we, we do, we, we spent 20 years othering the Afghan people. And, and, and I, you know, I mean that in a, in, a, in a broad way, like the media othered Afghan people. You know, you didn't see a lot of media uh, especially our big conglomerated media, uh, really talking about the plight of the regular Afghan people until you know we decided to drop a drone strike on a family of 10 the last day we were there, right? That's when it suddenly became a problem. Um, so, I mean, I just don't have faith in the United States government to actually extend a hand in good faith to any uh, uh, refugee or, or anybody or any of the other statuses that I'm, I'm not well versed on, um, you know, and, and I, that's why I think that it's, it's a pro, you know, they, that we haven't fixed this issue to get our allies that helped us out over here. Um, Alan, if you want to jump in on just, you know, why things have, if you have any more thoughts on that or um, I, I don't really know. Uh, I mean, it's, it's very difficult to understand the rationale of the State Department and how they um, allocate um, quotas for different nationalities from the refugee program. Um, the SIV program sits apart from the refugee program, um, but they're, I think they're always looking at numbers and they don't, they don't want to kind of uh, overwhelm um, 
you know, the system or, and, 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 and you know, affect public opinion. <laughs> um, obviously, uh, just to sort of piggyback on what Mike was saying in a general way about, you know, American politics, you know, a lot of it is optics. And, um, you know, those of us who work in immigration circles, you know, um, took to heart what the Biden administration said about, uh, you know, putting aside uh, a lot of uh, the previous administration's policies with regard to immigration, but now we see them really uh, extending them. Um, things really haven't changed that much. And they're more concerned about the numbers of folks coming up through the southern border um, than they are with any strictly humanitarian intentions. And, and um, you know, that's, that's a shame. I, I, you know, I, I honestly believe that we have the capacity to help many more people than we do, but um, I don't think that politicians uh, feel the same way. And, and this kind of, uh, these kind of optics and this kind of politics, I'm sure has affected the SIV pro uh, program to a degree, but I, I'm not really privy to, you know, the, the machinations of the State Department and, and the other organizations that have to do with this. I just know that um, all of the resettlement agencies and all the veterans groups that I'm, I'm connected with um, bemoan the fact that there are, you know, tens of thousands of SIVs who've been languishing in Afghanistan who could have come years ago. Thanks, Alan. Um, next, uh, we're gonna go zoom out more towards just the general foreign policy. Um, and what message does this withdrawal send to both US allies and adversaries around the region, around the world? Um, Eric, if you wanna start with this. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, I think one thing, we, uh, one message that it, that it can be sending is that the, the US uh, does not value all of its allies once, once an engagement is completed. Um, we saw a, a different situation, but with some similarities, the way we um, dealt with the Kurds um, in, in the Syrian conflict just a couple of years ago. Um, we, we had similar things in, in Vietnam. Um, the, the message could be, you know, it, it's dangerous to be an ally of the US, um, especially if once an engagement is done, you still have to live with the problems in, in the place that, that you're from. So the Afghans still in Afghanistan have to live with the Taliban. Um, and one message could be, you know, if, if you're an ally, especially if you're not a, a, a major power, or if you're, if you're not even a national entity, you're, you're a resistance group or something um, of that order, um, it, it may or may not be beneficial to, uh, to seek out the US as, as a partner, um, because that relationship is not necessarily valued. Mike, if you wanna jump in. Yeah, I mean, th this is a tricky one, right? Because um, different countries are gonna take this different ways. I'm on board with Eric a lot, you know, honestly across the board, that, that is absolutely true. Um, and the sad thing is, I think this is only kind of like cementing the fact that a lot of our, I, I don't know, uh, you know, maybe, maybe non-governmental allies, you know, like uh, Eric can point out, like the Kurds, um, you know, the, our, our comrades in Afghanistan and, and uh, you know, the, the dozens of other locales on the planet where we're having shooting wars that we don't know about, right? Um, like, a lot of these groups already know how the United States treats allies like that. Like, we, we saw it firsthand with the Kurds during the Gulf War, like when we pulled out and left and, you know, saw Saddam went after them. Um, you know, like this is only cementing that fact that we spent 20 years at war in this country, uh, occupying that country, um, like literally just burning piles of cash in that country. Um, and, and we, while the war had to wrap up, I think that I want people to know this. I believe the war should have been done and over with in 2011 when, you know, uh, bin Laden was killed. We shouldn't have stayed a day longer than that. Um, you know, of course, that goes back to let's plan. You know, we got Bin Laden. We have a plan ready to, to hand things over and, and kind of be there as a, as a backstop for, for Karzai at the time, right? Um, 
but if this is how we treat allies, who's really going to want our help at this point? Like, honestly, um, you know, we made a mess in Iraq, we made a mess in Afghanistan, we made a mess in Syria, um, you know, and non-militarily speaking, we've made a mess in a lot of other countries. Uh, you know, who really wants us there at this point? Um, another Q&A from the audience related to that topic from Ian. Uh, do you think that in 10 years from now, we will look back on the withdrawal as a turning point in post 9-11 US foreign policy? Or will much of what has characterized the past 20 years of the war on terror continue on? Um, up for anyone. I mean, I, I think this is the problem with, with the United States. When we gave the thumbs up, when the government gave the thumbs up to go to war in Afghanistan, and they put it under that big umbrella of the global war on terror, it allowed the United States to just unilaterally go into places uh, and, and fight terrorism, right? Like, I, you know, a lot of people don't realize we are actively, like, taking part in embargo of Yemen, uh, you know, while 24 million people are at risk of, of starvation, uh, you know, we have people fighting in the Southern Islands in the Philippines. You know, we, we have people all over the planet right now that are, that are actively engaged in combat operations that you don't really hear about, right? But it's, it's okay because it's under the global war on terror. And until, honestly, we as, as, as a, a country, like, leverage our politicians into completely eliminating that, you know, that title. You're, we're still going to have this kind of American adventurism. I think it's just going to take, it's, it, they'll take one mask off and put another one on and, and they'll go into the next uh, conflict. You know, I think I'll shift this question a little bit to more of your experience. Um, Lark has sent a bunch of great questions in for us. Um, more on the regional implication side. So I'll use this time to plug. We have a, another panel at 1.30 tomorrow. They'll be on, focus more on regional implications um, of, of the war in Afghanistan or the withdrawal and um, takeover by the Taliban. Um, but he, he notes he's been working with um, over 300 people um, trying to evacuate them across the Uzbek border. Um, and he noted that no SIVs were processed during the Trump administration. Um, so he's had some in process since, since 2013. Um, how, how did that affect um, the work you were doing, Alan? And are you at all optimistic about um, the new administration doing more? You seem to be pretty pessimistic at the moment, but you can share your thoughts. Hey, Alan, I think you're just muted, sorry. Yeah, I'm, I'm not um, entirely sure I understand the question, but is it that I, I'm optimistic that more will be done to um, bring refugees out of Afghanistan at this point? Uh, yeah, are you optimistic that under the new administration um, that things could change, that immigration policies could be updated? My apologies, Lark, she. Yeah, I, it's very hard for me to say. I mean, I, I, I would like to take um, Secretary of State Blinken as, at his word that um, we'll continue to try to help uh, people come out on, uh, you know, uh, commercial flights um, and work with the Taliban to, you know, to get uh, parolees uh, who've completed applications out. Um, you know, I don't know um, if this is going to be a priority for the administration, I know it's a priority for a lot of groups around the United States who are working with individuals. Um, it's been a very difficult, frustrating time right now. Um, and, you know, there, there are different ways to go about this. Uh, I, there are land routes to get out of the country and then to apply for refugee status because those uh, who want to come as refugees have to cross a border first. Um, and, uh, you know, they're, it's complicated. Um, and, you know, I don't think this is going to be a high priority for the administration, frankly. I think the highest priority for them right now is to somehow find a way to work with the uh, 60 some thousand folks who are already here in the United States and the others who are on bases overseas. 
Um, so they probably don't want to add to those numbers. But um, yeah, I, uh, I'm not really sure. The administration recently set the presidential determination at 125,000 uh, for refugees, which is what the ask was uh, until the uh, Kabul fell. And then we increased the ask to 200,000 so that we could bring in additional Afghan refugees, but that didn't happen. Um, so um, yeah, I'm not really sure that I'm answering the question very well, but the truth of the matter is, is I don't really know the answer. So I think we'll finish up sort of about uh, 11 more minutes. Um, we'll do a few more um, audience Q&A questions. And again, thank you everyone for joining us. Um, so we have one question. Do you think the ethnic ties of some government officials with the Taliban had any effects on the sudden fall of the Afghan National Army? Um, Eric, if you have any knowledge on the subject, go Mike. Um, yeah, it, it could have. It's not something I've, I've given a lot of thought to uh, thus far, but it, it definitely could. Uh, it definitely could. Um, like we've said, uh, Mike has said it before as well. Um, it, it's a very tribal country. It, it's, it's a country that in many ways thrives on tribal and kinship bonds. Um, and another, another thing to note is it's, uh, it's, it's a country that we, we've seen it certainly with the, with the ANA, we've seen it under the Karzai regime especially, but it, it's a country that where, where corruption is, is rampant. Um, it's not limited to Afghanistan. We see this in uh, culturally throughout a number of Central Asian countries, Southwestern Asian countries. Um, and frankly, we see it all over the place and the, the lack of infrastructure in Afghanistan allows this, this culture to, to thrive. Um, I, I could, I don't have knowledge of it, but I could, I could see that being a factor. Um, uh, relationships with, you know, particular individuals could play a role there, but I, I don't have any specific knowledge. On my second deployment, when I was in the Argandab River Valley, um, <laughs> the, the primary ANA unit we worked with were Tajiks and they had them fighting in a Pashtun area. Um, and the reason was, this was one of Karzai's last things he did while he was transitioning out and Ghani was coming in, was to build national, like that Afghan, that abstract Afghan idea was, well, you're not going to fight in the places where you enlisted and trained at. You're going to fight in other areas so the Pashtuns can see that the Tajiks are as equally bought in to the idea of this, this larger, you know, as we called it, Giroa you know, the, the greater Islamic Republic of Afghanistan, right? Uh, and it was not smart. Uh, if anything, it, it kind of painted a bigger target on their backs because when you have uh, uh, an area like the Argandab River, which Eric can tell you runs right through Taliban heartland, uh, they're not very happy about seeing other groups of people there. Um, I mean, I like that, that's my small little micro uh, look to, you know, and I hopefully that answer, but I wouldn't be surprised like at a macro level that there might have been something to do with that. Yeah, so earlier Mike mentioned the drone strike that killed 10 Afghan civilians and that was in response to an ISIS-K attack on the airport. Um, it killed uh, over a dozen um, American troops and many, many more Afghan civilians. Um, after the suicide bombing at the airport, and this uh, from the audience. Um, after suicide bombing at the airport, what measures will the U.S. take to defeat ISK? Will it be similar to the 1982 Beirut barracks attack, where there will not be a significant retaliation, or will the U.S. actively seek to defeat the group? Also, to what extent uh, do you guys believe that ISK threatens U.S. interests? And I guess more broadly, um, what are your predictions on whether terrorist groups will thrive like they did under the first Taliban rule. I mean, honestly, <clears throat> I don't see ISIS forces in Afghanistan picking up steam the way they did in places like Iraq or Syria. Uh, honestly, because of how the, the cultural and linguistic groups in Afghanistan are. It, it, you know, we've already talked about how they don't 
work well together. And when they do, it's, it's for short periods of time, right? They, they, they're not what you would call buddies. But you know what they dislike more than each other? Outsiders coming into the country. Um, you know, they're, they're a very proud and, and very, uh, uh, I don't want to say insular is the right word, but they're leery of outsiders, right? Um, and I mean, there, there's been reports that, you know, the Taliban was even being rubbed the wrong way by, by Al Qaeda and bin Laden, you know, right after the attacks occurred, you know? So I, I don't see like, a big ISIS push into Afghanistan. I just only because of those cultural, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, uh, the, the the cultural issues that would arise. Um, but as far as like if we're talking about big international terrorism, I mean, I, I hate to kind of put it bluntly like this, but we're going to be dealing with this forever as long as the major industrial powers continue to prioritize. Uh, uh, monetary gain, right? Like, as long as we think that we have a, a, you know, we have to have a footprint in this area for American interests, you know, we're always going to have that. You know, the United States isn't welcome in a lot of places. I mean, when my last deployment in 2012, the Taliban literally controlled half the districts in the country, you know, and this is after, you know, we're, we're, we're 11 years in at that point, right? Like it, we're not welcome, but we, we trying to, you know, force our way in. And as long as we continue to do that because of American interests, we're going to deal with terrorism. That's, you know, and I, maybe these groups are able to hit us here again, like the, the perpetrators of 9-11 did, you know, or they're hitting our, our, you know, our military posts and like the 112 countries we have a military presence in. I mean, you know, and anything's possible, honestly. But I, I don't think international terrorism is going to go away uh, as, as an issue that America has to deal with. Yeah, um, if I could just jump in and uh, sort of piggyback on what uh, Mike had said. Um, I think what happened with uh, Al Qaeda coming in uh, in the 90s into Afghanistan was a very kind of specific situation where they, it's almost like the Taliban were granting them asylum after they had been run out of, um, run out of Sudan. So um, they, they weren't so much coming in and trying to take over, coming in and trying to co-opt them. Uh, it was they were seeking refuge. And um, the, the, the Taliban were, were you know, sort of also shocked by what happened on 9-11 but it was through their uh, the the Pashtun code, Pashtun Wali, where they this was their guest. They're not going to hand them over. Um, if anyone's seen the film Lone Survivor, where um, I forget if it's Marcus Luttrell is the character um, who uh, he's he's taken in by a, a Pashtun family. It's 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 part of that code, Melmastia, uh, in in Pashtun Wali. Um, so I, I, I think it's, it's, they're, they're not analogous. It, it's, it's a different situation, um, a, di a different time, and it's specific to that time and place. Um, another thing to consider is that um, ISIS uh, has sort of uh, a fairly specific uh, worldview and, and interpretation of Islam. Um, and while the Taliban are, you know, very kind of, we can look at them as being barbaric and very, um, austere in some ways in their interpretation it's they're they're not they're not the same thing like um the the islam that we see embodied by the taliban is not it's not pure it's not we're not looking straight at the text it's infused with uh with their culture with uh with their their own um sort of tribal beliefs tribal practices so i think that at some point there you would see a clash between the two because um both would look at their own worldview, their own philosophy as being, you know, the ultimate, and they, they're not, they're not one and the same thing. So we just have a couple of minutes left. Um, so we won't be able to get to all the questions, but um, I noticed one question was about um, specific issues for women and children. And uh, as we mentioned at the start, we were trying really hard to get um, Afghan and women voices on every panel for this symposium. Uh, there's only part one. Um, and we're unfortunately just able to, uh, due to the ongoing nature of the events in Afghanistan, 
thin and just um, confidentiality reasons. We weren't able to get um, anyone on um, for this panel, but uh, tomorrow we have a panel at uh, 1.30 p.m. Um, on the regional implications of Taliban control, and then at 3 p.m. Um, on more specifically the future for women under Taliban rule. Um, so we have um, a journalist from Afghanistan, uh, Tafra Hurdiati, um, Anna Larson, who's a professor at Tufts, um, Simon Royesh, uh, who founded a language academy in Afghanistan, and Rafia Zakaria, who is an author, attorney, and human rights activist. Um, so please tune in for those tomorrow. And if maybe the, each of the panelists wants to finish up, just a quick um, 20 to 30 seconds, maybe your hopes, fears for the future of Afghanistan. I know it's a very short time frame for such a big question, but. Um, yeah, so I'll, I think I'll, I'll sum up uh, with an anecdote that I have from uh, one of my uh, a female, it's sort of in the spirit of uh, these panels being uh, inclusive of women's issues as well. Um, an anecdote I have from a female instructor I had in language school. Um, well, during the reign of the Taliban, while she was in Afghanistan, walking down the street with her son, maybe like 10, 11 years old, there was gunfire and Taliban were present in the street. And this woman, who was like the sweetest, most grandmotherly woman I've ever met, um, hid behind her son because it was safer for the Taliban to see a, a child than it was to see a woman in the street. So um, I don't, I don't know how that factors into how things bode for Afghanistan, but um, I'm as much as I would want to be hopeful uh, at this, this juncture. I am not um, particularly hopeful of what's going to happen. Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm terrified uh, for you know the the friends I have that are still there, uh, and the friends that I I've made uh, you know that are that made it to the United States for their family over there. Um, you know, I I don't think anybody can argue uh, that the Taliban is a group of good dudes, right? Like I don't think anybody could argue that point. Um, but I will say we have to do better next time. The the nation as a whole has to do better next time. We completely decimated that country. Um, and I, I, I can honestly say, I don't think they're better off for it. Um, you know, I, I'm with Eric. I don't see anything positive coming uh, from Afghanistan for the next few years. And I can only hope that, you know, Alan and, and other uh, people that are doing the hard work that they're doing can get as many people over as they can. Um, and then we collectivize our, our energy into forcing the government uh, to, to take care of the people that took care of us when we were over there. I, I don't know what, what the uh, future has in store for Afghanistan now, but I mean, I think that there was a generation of um, Afghan nationals or Afghan people, Afghan women and girls who, um, you know, they're going to bring their experience. Um, um, they're going to live their experience uh, through the next years and, um, you know, hopefully, um, you know, be able to influence, uh, have some influence. I don't know how that's going to pan out, but I do know that um, the women and, and girls who we know here in the United States um, are going to get every opportunity to become advocates um, and uh, agents for their own lives. And, um, you know, there's a, there's a small but very uh, strong Afghan community in, in New Jersey. It doesn't compare to uh, parts of California or Virginia, other places where there's been more Afghan resettlement. Um, but uh, we, we are organizing now, um, and, and I say we in a, in a very large sense, um, but uh, because I'm not Afghan myself, but, um, but I, I'm watching it happen and it's really impressive. And there are uh, Looks like we lost Alan, um, if he comes back and finish up, but um, just really want to thank everyone um, for coming out both virtually um, and in person at, at Fletcher School at Tufts. 
Um, I certainly learned a ton from, from all three panelists and thank you so much for sharing your experiences and perspectives. Um, and again, please join us tomorrow um, for parts two and three of, of our panel. Um, so 1.30 p.m. Um, we're gonna be doing a panel on regional implications and then 3 p.m. Um, panel on uh, the impact of toddling control on women's rights. And then if you're here at Tufts, um, you can come by the academic quad, uh, the tent by Miller Hall at 12 p.m. to 12.45 for um, some refreshments and lunch from uh, Nor Cuisine um, in Somerville. But thank you so much, Alan, Eric, Mike, and everyone for joining us. Have a great night.